Leave it be, lad. The men were drowned. But if no one searched the island... It's called the Black Island. McGregor, he has a right to know. On today's episode, Tintin is chased across the Scottish Highlands and throws a brick at a giant gorilla only on Radio Tintin, the Black Island. Out for a leisurely stroll, Tintin comes across an unmarked plane that has landed in the middle of the countryside for repairs. He tries to help and is promptly shot, a powerful warning about the importance of minding your own business. Recovering in hospital, Tintin is informed by detectives Thompson and Thompson that a plane matching the one he described crashed in Sussex, England the night previously, and so he sets out to investigate. Along the way, two criminals frame Tintin for robbery, and he is arrested by the Thompsons, but he escapes because they're not very good at their job. Now on the run from the law, he follows the clues to uncover a forgery ring led by the psychologist Dr. Mueller and pursues the doctor to rural Scotland and his base of operations on the Black Island, a mysterious island off the coast that is supposedly haunted by a ferocious beast that kills any intruders. The beast turns out to be a gorilla, which is fortunately terrified of Snowy, and Tintin manages to contact the police and have the entire gang arrested, exposing their plans to distribute counterfeit currency all over Europe. Tintin, you may not have written a single article in the past eight years, but when it comes to exposing shady underworld figures, there's no journalist better. The Black Island was serialised in Le Petit Vintiem between the 15th of April 1937 and the 16th of June 1938. As hard as Tintin worked to put away thieves and gangsters on the pages, Hergé was working even harder to put those pages together, and Benoit Peters notes that, quote, even more than the popular front in France, the war in Spain, or Hitler's growing arrogance, what marked these years for Hergé was a nearly unending stream of work. Hergé worked seven days a week to prepare not only the Tintin adventures, but those of his other ongoing series, Quick and Flupke and Joe, Zet and Jocko. By now he had made the decision to work from home, away from the distractions of Levithium Cicle's offices, but isolated from most companionship as well. His wife Germaine was his most important confidant and collaborator at this stage, though she too noted the physical and mental toll his workload took on him. In short, all the signs of the burnout and breakdown that would afflict him in the immediate post-war years were present as he began work on The Black Island. As he wrote to his representative at Casterman Publishing House, quote, I can't take the slightest break. Flu, imprisonment, brick dropping on my head, end quote. Yet, it would be a mistake to assume it was only contractual obligation that spurred him on, and reading through his correspondence from the time, one is given the strong impression of a man enslaved by his own legacy, Slowing down was impossible until Tintin had reached the heights his creator believed him destined for. Though he lived comfortably, if not extravagantly, on his income, Hergé was frustrated by Tintin's standing in the Belgian children's book market. And while Tintin had always moved the needle on newspaper form, his popularity never seemed to translate quite as well when they were collected into album format. In fact, the 10,000 copies of Tintin in the Land of the Soviets hadn't been topped in the eight years since its publication, which must have frustrated Hergé tremendously given the dramatic increase in the quality of the story since. He made meticulous notes of Tintin's representation when he visited bookshops, and frequently wrote to Casterman expressing his frustration that the few Tintin albums on display seemed to always be overshadowed by those of his competitors, works he deemed correctly, as history would show, inferior in quality. Hergé blamed Castman for not pushing his stories more aggressively, while Castman continued to push Hergé to colorize his pages. It would be a mistake to think that the collectible items emblazoned with Tintin's face available readily, if not cheaply, online and in the various officially endorsed boutiques across the world are nothing more than a cynical cash grab made by modern executives greedily capitalizing on Tintin's fame. It was around this time that Hergé himself, according to Peters, first envisioned a specialty Tintin store that would sell not only his books, but Tintin games, jigsaws, calendars, etc, etc. But given Hergé's workload, the creation of such a store would have to wait. Perhaps it's fitting that, just as Hergé was more concerned with his sales than the flare and conflict in Europe between democracy and fascism, the Black Island relegated political concerns to the background to focus on a story of counterfeiting. That's not to say the story was not at all inspired by contemporary events. Michael Farr notes that, in his schemes, the villain Dr. Mueller is reminiscent of Dr. George Bell, a Scot living in Germany who forged Russian rubles to destabilise the Soviet economy 
for the Nazis. More generally, inflation was an ongoing economic concern in the years following the First World War, and monetary policy was never far from the front pages. However, despite the ever-growing concerns about the expansionist policies of Nazi Germany, the anti-German sentiment in the Black Island is confined to the presence of Mueller, who is never shown to be officially associated with any national government, and forges German banknotes along with French and English. Like Belgium since 1936, the Black Island must be officially considered politically neutral. Nevertheless, it must be said that Urge's Britain is a charming place, perhaps reflective of a natural Belgian Anglophilia. It was Great Britain, of course, that pledged to guarantee Belgian neutrality after the latter's establishment in 1839, the violation of which triggered British involvement in the First World War. Indeed, the worst Britain has to offer in the Black Island is one particularly stern police officer who charges Tintin with illegally picking fruit after a runaway caravan carrying the reporter crashes into an apple tree. Indeed, many Tintinologists have noted that the Black Island, more than any other Tintin story, owes its inspiration to the silver screen more than contemporary newspapers. The biggest comparison to draw is with Alfred Hitchcock's 1933 adaption of John Buchan's The 39 Steps, in which an innocent man travels through England and Scotland by car, plane and train to uncover a nefarious international plot pursued by both foreign agents and the police. The comparison extends visually to the Thompsons, who are handcuffed together in a sequence very reminiscent of the film's third act. The gorilla Ranko, who protects the titular island from superstitious Scottish locals, is a combination of the Loch Ness Monster of Scottish folklore, the first alleged photo of which was published in 1934, and the hugely popular King Kong, who captivated cinema goers the year previous. Michael Farr notes that even the name Ranko is two letters away from RKO, the studio that produced the film King Kong, though Randy and Jean Mark Lofficer also draw comparisons with the murderous gorilla Baloo from the novel of the same name by French author Gaston Leroux. Mueller, for his part, bears an uncanny resemblance to actor Charles Lawton in his portrayal of the sinister Dr. Moreau in 1932's Island of Lost Souls. Cinema was, of course, central to Urge's creative vision. I think of my stories as films, he would say in a 1942 interview. And in crafting the adventures of Totor, Tintin's spiritual predecessor, he styled the comic strips as movies with him as the director. From the Black Island's gripping pursuits to the climax atop the ruins of Craig Dewey Castle, there's undeniably a cinematic quality to the album. Both the narrative and the illustrations are expertly paced, fixing some of the disjointed and slapdash composition present in the preceding Broken Ear. Despite a rapid change of location, the story never appears rushed. The action scenes, such as Tintin's fight with Mueller, are vivid and dynamic, as well composed as in any Hollywood blockbuster, and balancing tension with Urge's typical humour and vibrancy. You don't read these scenes as much as you do watch them. Perhaps the story's biggest drawback is the lack of quality villains. Urge was particularly proud of Mueller and noted, quote, Mueller is a Rostopopoulos who will pay even more dearly. Mueller is quick and full of energy, while the other is soft and fat, end quote. The German doctor would actually beat Rostopopoulos to become the first ever recurring villain of the series, gracing the pages with a shaved head and long beard in 1941's Land of Black Gold, which was ultimately left incomplete due to the Second World War and wouldn't be finished until 1950. And he then appeared again in The Red Sea Sharks in 1958. In these latter appearances, and in particular in The Land of Black Gold, he is fantastically imbued with all the ruthlessness Urge saw in him. But in his first appearance in The Black Island? Well, despite Urge's distinction, he is indeed a little too soft and fat, a little too well-dressed, and he isn't particularly distinguished from the other members of the posse he shares screen time with, possessing neither the menace of Rostopopoulos or Mitsuharatu from The Blue Lotus, nor the comedic timing of Ramon and Alonso from The Broken Ear. The most sinister he seems is when he arranges for Tintin to be sent to his own special mental institution, in which the patients aren't always mad when they arrive, but certainly end up that way after a few hours of treatment. As an aside, this is the second time Urge has had villains using induced insanity as a weapon, after the Rajaja juice or Poison of Madness featured so prominently in Cigars of the Pharaohs and Blue Lotus, and a psychoanalyst could make the case that Urge held some sort of deep-seated fear of losing his mind. Regardless, it's a chilling scene in the Black Island, and it's a shame that Urge dropped evil psychologist from Mueller's resume in his later appearances. The Thompsons are prominently featured once more, and Black Island would mark the final time in which they pursue Tintin for a crime he did not commit, perhaps finally realising that Tintin is, in fact, a very good boy. 
Their comedic escapades here are one of the story's highlights. Snowy too is in top form, balancing Tintin's relentless pursuit with his search for bones, and later in the story, whiskey, an addiction he would grapple with in future stories. Even before the introduction of Captain Haddock, Urge, though no teetotaler, clearly envisioned drunkenness as an effective avenue to showcase comedy, while, through Tintin's stern admonishing, still promoting Boy Scout temperance. However, readers may find his condemnation of Snowy a little hypocritical, given just how wasted he found himself only in the previous story. The story was released as an album by Casterman in 1938, before being reformatted slightly and released in colour in 1943. Typically, that would summarise the publication history of Urge's pre-war stories. Serialised in black and white, published in album form in black and white, and then republished in album form in colour. However, The Black Island is a true oddity in the series. This is because in 1966, Methuen, the English language publishers of the series, balked at translating the 1943 edition of the story, finding Urge's Britain anachronistically inaccurate and fearing it would prove too alien for British readers. Thoroughly, if pedantically, they compiled a list of 131 errors of detail that would need to be amended before publication. Urge, who visited only the south coast of England as part of his initial research for the story, consented and sent his most prominent post-war collaborator, the immensely talented Bob de Moore, on a two-week trip to document the necessary details for what would become the current modernised edition of The Black Island available today. The result is a story that is exactly the same, but completely different. In the words of Lossifer, quote, more slick but less atmospheric, end quote. Produced almost 30 years apart, the original Black Island definitely looks like one of Urge's pre-war albums, while the modern edition fits in seamlessly with the polished aesthetic of the Studio Urge era of the 50s and 60s. The changes in dress, vehicles, and decor are innumerable, but perhaps the most interesting alteration, evocative of the world of difference between the two time periods, is when Tintin hears voices behind a door and barges in to find a television set. Now, in the original 1938 edition, Tintin exclaims, it's a television set, his surprise warranted by the fact that television broadcasts were indeed a novelty at the time, relegated only to the British Isles. The surprise is retained in the 1943 edition, though Urge, ever the futurist, depicts the television display in full colour, which would not become widespread in our world until after the 1960s. Though, of course, Professor Calculus memorably experiments with colour broadcasts in 1963's The Castafiore Emerald. By 1966, of course, television was no longer a novelty, and Tintin's surprise is changed to relief that nobody is waiting behind the door, noting, rather than exclaiming, it's only a television set. Interestingly, the display reverts back to black and white in this edition, reflecting the accuracy of this particular edition. Some fans argue that the modern Black Island is too clinical and lacks the imagination of the original, but Urge was, if nothing else, a slave to accuracy, and it seems unfair to expect a man that researched nuclear fusion in order to make Tintin's moon voyage more accurate refuse to change the uniforms of British railway employees. Fortunately, facsimile editions of both the 1938 black and white and 1943 colour editions are available to purchase, so you still can see what they originally look like. Though, expect to pay through the nose if you don't read French. Believe me. Overall, if the broken ear represented a drop in overall quality in the Tintin series after the lofty heights of the Blue Lotus, then the Black Island must be considered a stirring and invigorating return to form, combining tension, humour, and fast-paced action in a memorable and beautifully depicted setting. So on my Instagram page, Tintin.podcast, I asked what the rest of the Tintin community thought of Tintin the Black Island. And as I sort of expected, it's been unanimous praise. Tintin Import Official says it's one of his favorites. Barrow Tapin Philippe says one of the best. Jerome K. EJ Fan says one of the best, one of his favorites. Sergio Laconforti says it's one of his favorites. Simon DeCresta, favorite. Sarah Felton Official, I really love the setting and the cover art too. I love the cover art as well. 
well. I've got the the cover art to the Black Island framed in my in my house, and I love the cover art for the earlier 1943 edition as well. It shows Tintin walking up to the castle rather than approaching it by boat. But I love them both. McCormick McBeal says it's definitely one of his favourites. L4 E Chesit. It's always been my mum's favourite, and I cherish a 1950s edition. Well, hang on to that 1950s edition because it's almost certainly the 1943 one before the massive changes took place. Instagram underscore one, quite enjoyable, and I was fascinated by how much it changed from the original to the UK publication. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. It's, um, it was, it, you know, especially coming as late as it did in the 1960s, that was sort of after Urge had adapted all of his pre-war stories, so they were, you know, supposedly all modernized it was very interesting that the it was the the publishers in uk who who thought it you know would be too too different for british readers and it's very interesting that you know urge went along with the whole retooling of the story the whole uh changing the whole visual aesthetic annie modart says when i was a kid it was my favorite being scottish and seeing tintin right here but as i got older less so the earlier comics are great, peak comfy, but the stories aren't as mature in terms of build-up and pacing. Very interesting. First of all, I can imagine it'd be great to see Tintin in Scotland. We never got to see Tintin in Australia, so that would be nice to see Tintin in your country. Early comics are great, peak comfy, but the, the stories aren't as mature in terms of build-up and pacing. Generally, I agree with you, but I think Black Island does a really good job of building it up. Sort of building up to that climax at the castle. I think it's... um think it's very very well done but certainly Urge's work was always improving so dramatically he sort of got better at, at, at building up to those climaxes. Sarah underscore Belmas underscore illustration one of the Tintin adventures I appreciate the most you can feel this ambience proper to Scotland. I grew up both with the comics and the animated series in 1991. The comic has now an other view as an adult because of the money traffic. I really see Mueller as a rough and hard character as he's a psychiatrist. My favourite part of the comic is the frame where Tintin and Mueller fight. I could stay fixed on it for hours, but not as much as the special frame in The Secret of the Unicorn. I totally know what you mean about Mueller. First of all, I love the part that he's a psychiatrist and I think that's... I think it's disappointing that uh, Urge didn't capitalize upon that more. The idea of this rogue psychiatrist who sort of has this ability to, to you know, see into your, your mind or whatever. I think that'd be a really, really interesting villain to explore. And we only really get sort of one sort of instance of that becoming a threat. And then I don't believe it's mentioned at all in, in Miller's later appearances. I wish they stayed with that. And I know what you mean by that fight scene. I really, I was the same. I, I really read it over and over again. It, it played out like I was watching a fight scene on film, just perfectly paced. He did a really good job with that. Pentagy or Pentagy says, I honestly loved it. Starting from how amazing it was to see original, then remade one, where all the surroundings were actually very improved for the story going itself. Also, the fact the difference between Black Island and Congo. Tintin not forcing himself into anyone's culture, more of coming to help in doing it on their terms, in their way. The fact he wore a kilt and all was kind of highlighting the fact. I felt like it was a good change for Tintin character in general. It was a good story, one of the more memorable ones, and one of my faves. Yeah, interesting to see him customize himself to the to the Scottish culture rather than imposing himself as he does in the Congo. I think you're quite right. He does adopt the native dress that sort of becomes sort of like an iconic scene of Tintin wearing the kilt. But yeah, I guess it is representative of, 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 of Tintin's changing attitude and certainly of Urge's changing attitude as well. Certainly he's becoming a lot more open to outside cultures, a lot more accepting of them. And also <laughs> the fact that he doesn't shoot Ranko, the giant monkey, like he does with all those monkeys in Tintin the Congo. Um, I think that, that, that says a lot about Urge's changing attitudes as well. The fact that Tintin doesn't just blow the monkey's head off, which I think would be quite startling to see. GT Avalito says, I like the never ending chase. It has a nostalgic value for me insofar as being one of the first that I read along with Land of the Black Gold. My first two albums led me to believe that Dr. Mueller was something of a master criminal, not an agent saboteur of a hostile power. Later on, I caught on just how political the stories were in their context. One thing I don't like about the angularization of is that it modernizes the album look too much and loses the pre-war feel. The look of the villains is weird for the time, and the character design for Ranko, the gorilla monster, doesn't look as appropriate in that style. It looks too cartoony for the rest. Many years later, I saw Hitchcock's 39 Steps, which seems related to the scrappy adventure. Yeah, I think what you've said there about the never-ending chase is one of my favorite parts about it. Oh, I should say never-ending chase sort of with a purpose in mind. It's always propelling the plot forward. Even if you look back at Blue Lotus, there's a lot of moving back and forth. Tintin goes to one house and he goes back. There's not sort of a straight line of, of progress driving the plot forward. There's a lot of meandering about um, moving back and forth. And I think you're quite right. That was very reminiscent of Hitchcock's 39 Steps, which you're certainly not the only person 
to draw comparisons with. I don't know if Urge explicitly modeled it on that. He may have. He was a pretty big cinema fan, as we mentioned. But certainly that's one, that's the biggest film that always is compared with The Black Island. Regarding the political context of the stories, in my mind, I like to believe that Mueller is working for the Nazis. I like to believe that's sort of what he's meant to be, even if it's not explicitly stated. That's sort of my headcanon, I believe the term is. That's what I choose to believe, even if it's not expressly um, displayed in, in, in the album. Because, yeah, he's never identified explicitly with one national government, but I think it's more exciting to imagine that he is, that he is sort of this, the working for, for an unfriendly power. And obviously that would be Nazi Germany. He's a German story set in England. You know, there's a threat of war going on at the time. It's an interesting take that, that Ranko doesn't fit in with the modernized version. And I think that's something I hadn't really considered. It's certainly this idea of a island being guarded by a giant monkey. It certainly seems more at place in the 1930s Tintin albums rather than the 1960s. It's hard to imagine, you know, something like that occurring in, in stories like Destination Moon, which are so grounded in science and reality, featuring something like a, a giant monkey. <laughs> but having said that, it is one of the most iconic parts of the story and one of the parts I do love so much. I love Ranko. Everyone loves Ranko. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted their thoughts on it. I really do get quite a lot out of seeing what the other thoughts are, especially if they're things that maybe aren't, aren't talked about that much in regards to the, the, the comics. Sort of, I like getting the unique perspectives on this, getting me to think about them a bit more. For my part, I've always loved Black Island. I've always loved the, the, the I've always loved the mystery element of it, the, the spy factor, which is, you know, not to say I don't like it when the Tinted albums get political. And actually one of the reasons I like the next Tintin album so much is because it's so political, but it just, it seems like I was aware that it was Hitchcockian before I was aware what Hitchcockian meant. Certainly, you know, the chases along the train and the, the coming up to the island at the end. And the fact that I guess it is grounded in sort of this, this high stakes, but very realistic plot of, of, of forgery. This is sort of the closest you could say Tintin gets to like James Bond territory or spy territory. Although having said that, there are some post-war adventures that fit that mold pretty well. Regardless, I think Tintin and Black Island has always been my sort of top five um, without much hesitation. So it was really, really a delight to go back and read it again and read all the surrounding information about it, all that extra information. I got so much out of it as well. Now, the reason this this review has been so delayed is because I was waiting, and I'm still waiting, for those facsimile editions, particularly the 1943 edition. I really, really wanted to have read that one first before I did my review, so I could have really got a gauge for the tone. But having said that, they're only really available affordably in French, so it's not like I would have been able to read the whole story anyway. So I thought I can't delay it anymore, I've got to put the story out. Fortunately I'd be able to find some some pictures that highlight the differences between the, the those two editions of the story. And they'll be going up my Instagram for those who are interested. Seeing how the artwork developed over time and seeing the difference between the 43 and the 66 edition. Thank you to everybody who's waited so patiently and who's listened to this episode. If you enjoy the show, there are a few things you can do if you'd like to help out. Definitely jump on Instagram or Facebook if you have it. Instagram is Tintin.podcast and Facebook is Facebook.com slash Radio Tintin Podcast, one word. Also, if you'd consider giving me a five-star review on your app of choice, certainly helps people find the show, makes it seem a bit more... Uh, I don't know, polished, not just some guy doing it in his room alone, which it is, but we don't need people to know that. Also, for those who are that way inclined, the Patreon for the show is patreon.com slash Radio Tintin. It is only paying per episode, meaning if I don't produce anything for this show, patrons don't pay a thing. You only pay something if I actually make an episode and it starts at $1 per episode. But that's not for everybody. I'm definitely not thinking about moving this into a subscription-only service because I just enjoy talking to people about Tintin. But if you're that way inclined and you'd like to chip in a few dollars, I'm not going to stand in your way. So that's patreon.com slash Radio Tintin. But if you can't, I'd say definitely 
jump on the Instagram or the Facebook because that way we can chat about all things Tintin. And that is probably the best part of doing this podcast is, is, is connecting with people socially and discussing the differences of opinions over the books and, you know, the, the cool things we see in Tintin books because there's a lot of Tintin nerds out there and it's good to be amongst them. Well, that's all for this week of Radio Tintin. Very excited about next episode. It won't take as long as this one did, but I'm very excited because I get to talk about another one of my all-time favorite Tintin stories, and that is King Ottokar's Scepter, a very politically charged Tintin story. And don't worry, we'll definitely be going into the background about how it came to be. But until then, Tintin heads, this has been Radio Tintin. Thank you for tuning in.